All right, let us bow in a word of prayer. Father God, Father God, we are so thankful to have the breath of life in our lungs that, that Father, you, that you caused us to have. Father, we would not even be here if it weren't for you. Father, I pray that as we gather around the scriptures this morning, that, that, Father, you would open our eyes to see our ears to hear, that, Father, that we would, we would dedicate this time solely to you. And Father, I pray that if there are any words that are of me, that they would just fall to the ground. Father, that my words would be your words. Use me as a conduit to speak your words to your people. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. For those of you who are of working age, whether your business is hiring or not, are you understaffed? Yeah. Yeah. You always use more help, right? Always. Always use more help. Being understaffed is awful. Like, I cannot tell you how many, how many years in restaurants I have spent understaffed. I'm always hiring a, a, a wait staff. Always, <coughs> always hiring a wait staff. If it seemed like always short sure of cook, always needing a dishwasher. It just. It, 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 like it never seemed to end. It's like I'm constantly needing somebody because, well, I restaurant turnover is really high typically, especially in chain restaurants. But you see, what I, I, I have come to notice is that we're understaffed in Christianity too. We are. Like, seriously, I, I, I'm going to kind of give this timeline, and it may, it may shock some folks. I came back to the church and to the faith when I was 25. At 27, I was made a deacon. At 28, I was made an elder. <laughs> At 29, I was in school for ministry. That is how quickly everything happened. The church that, that we were in, the church that we were in had turnover like crazy. It, it was typically an older congregation, even though there were, there were young folks there. But, but people kind of shifted in and out. It was in St. Louis. It's a big town. People just kind of come and go. It's just the way it is. They hang around for six months and then they're, they're, they're gone again. Either moved or, you know, whatever the case may be. When I went to Tologa, I was 37 years old. I was there until I was 43. I was the second youngest pastor in western Oklahoma at 37 to 43 years old. There was one guy that was younger than me. The average <coughs> age of preachers in the year 2000 was the age of 50, was the average age of pastor. It is now 54 to 57. It has gone up. Ozark Christian College in 2022 graduated 50 preachers in a preacher program. All 50 of them went straight into full-time pulpits. Instead of going into youth ministry or as an associate pastor where they would learn the ropes of, of being a minister in a church underneath an older mentor where they would kind of learn how things function and they would kind of 
be able to cut their teeth under the tutelage of somebody more experienced than would be able to guide them. <laughs> Not the case. All 50 of them went straight into full-time ministry. All 50 of them. The stats on the average age of pastor, 54 to 57, I believe is very conservative. <laughs> I think it's much older than that. In western Oklahoma, when, in my tenure in, in, in Tologa, there, were, there, there was one guy younger than me. There were a handful of guys older than me in their 40s. There were another handful of guys in their 50s. Most of the guys were 65 plus. There was a guy that was in a pulpit who retired at 80 because he couldn't physically do it anymore. He had Parkinson's. He had to retire. He didn't have a choice. Otherwise, he'd have still been in the pulpit. Our scripture today is going to be in Luke 10. And the second verse is a verse that I know you know. The harvest is plenty, but the workers are few. Amen. We've got a problem. We have more harvest than we have workers. The fact of the matter is, is that evangelism is scary. Being in a pulpit is terrifying. I have had a conversation with Aaron and the guys. It's like, if I ever step in the pulpit at a time that I'm not nervous, I'm going to hang up the towel because I should be nervous every time I step up here. Because it is not easy. It is a daunting task. Literally, literally started with the master and the savior Jesus Christ and he's commissioned us to take his footsteps and to continue to preach Luke 10 1 to 16 is where we're going to be uh, let's read that after this the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them two by two ahead of them into every town and place where he was about to go he told them, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Go, I am sending you out like lambs among wolves. Do not take a purse or bag or sandals, and do not greet anyone on the road. When you enter a house, first say peace to this house. If someone who promotes peace is there, your peace will rest on them. If not, it will return to you. Stay there eating and drinking whatever they give you, for the worker deserves his wages. Do not move around from house to house. When you enter a town and eat welcomed, eat what is offered to you. Heal the sick who are there and tell them, the kingdom of God has come near to you. But when you enter a town and are not welcomed, go into its streets and say, even the dust of your town we wipe from our feet as a warning to you. Yet be sure of this. The kingdom of God has come near. I tell you, it will be more bearable on that day for Sodom than for that town. Woe to you, Chorazin. Woe to you, Bethsaida. For if the miracles that were performed in you had been performed in Tyre or Sidon, they would have repented long ago, sitting in sackcloth and ashes. But it will be more bearable for the Tyre and Sidon at the day of judgment for you. At, uh, and you, Capernaum, will be lifted Will you be lifted to the heavens? No, you will go down to the go down to Hades. Whoever listens to you listens to me. Whoever rejects you rejects me. But whoever rejects me rejects him who sent me. The question, the question that comes out of this, Jesus, Jesus says it. This is this is not something new. The harvest is plentiful, the workers are few. This is something Jesus said in his day. This is not something that's, oh, just all of a sudden it's happened. No. 
No, this has always been the case. Why is it so hard? Why is it so hard to find people to go out into the field and harvest? Because work's hard. I mean, his. I, those of you my age, do you, you remember the farmers who'd hire, uh, well, see, I grew up in Illinois where there's a ton of corn. Did they do anything like the tasseling corn down here? Was that ever a thing? Oh, okay. Okay, so up in, up in Illinois, I see this is, this is what, yeah, I'm Yankee kind of thing here going on. I, I grew up up north, and there's like cornfields of plenty. And, and in order to... <laughs> In order to pollinate the corn, literally they would hire guys to go out and detassel corn. And you'd, you'd break the stem off, about three quarters up, you'd break the stem off and, and let it you know, fall to the ground. And it would germinate and pollinate and do all the things it's supposed to do. And, and you talk about hot work. I mean, so down here our summers run 90, 100 degrees. Humidity's pretty high. Same thing up north, only you're in a cornfield that's really humid and it's like stifling hot. Um, going to work in a field is hard work. It is hard work. You will know that you've worked by the end of the day. It's not one of those jobs you know, you know, where you sit in an office chair all day and, and you know, you're mentally tired. This is just a plain out physical exhaustion. Because trust me, I'm exhausted at the end of a day. Just because I sit in a chair, it's mentally and emotionally draining. But it's a diff- working in a field is a different kind of draining. The church now has been around for 2,000 years. Why is it that there is a problem replacing pastors these days I was talking to some guys out back out west in western Oklahoma and one guy looked at me and he's like I can tell you of about five pulpits right now that are empty in western Oklahoma he's like right off the top of my head five pulpits and more are going to be empty in the next five years because the average age of the pastor out there has only gotten older. There's one guy in his 20s. Guy graduated in 22. He was part of that class. He, that's where that stat came for, comes from is because he graduated in the class of 22 in, um, at Ozark. He's 22, went straight into the pulpit. He's in Dover. Fortunately, He's got some, some older guys breathing life into him and helping train him up. But the problem that we're having is that the reason we aren't replacing pastors is because we're not creating them. We're not creating them at all. Why is it that we're not creating them? Remember back to the priority series. All of, I, I, I do things in, in, in series-oriented stuff but they all tie together. Remember back to the priority sermon series and remember what I said back then. The world has conditioned us to be career oriented, right? It's literally flipped the priorities from God, marriage, kids, and career on its head to where it's career, kids, marriage, and then God, okay? The reason we're not replacing pastors is because it is seen that pastoring a church is not a viable career, Case in point, a few years back, had a kid um, at camp, wanted to go into youth ministry, was feeling called to ministry. And they were on fire. And, and all of the pastors that were at the camp were like, oh my gosh, we've seen this for ages. Hallelujah. <laughs> you've seen the light. <laughs> Yes. Two weeks later, we got word that they are not going to go to Ozark because parents wouldn't pay for it because it is not a viable career. 
but he ended up not going to Ozark. Because the parents would not pay for an education to go into ministry. What are we raising our kids to do? Are we raising our kids to be kingdom workers or are we raising them to go out and get a career? See, the thing is, is that not only are our priorities messed up, but the churches are not producing Timothys either. I had another conversation a few years back with a guy. He's, at the time, he was 75, 76, 77, somewhere around there. And we were sitting around in, in an area ministers meeting. It's just a, a literally we get together once a month and we would come together and just we'd pray for each other, we'd study, we'd have a conversation, we'd eat lunch, um, encourage one another. And the subject of the morning was Timothy's in the church. And this guy popped up and he's like, you know, I don't. I don't know that I've ever produced a Timothy in 50 years of ministry. Whoa. What? Very serious. He didn't think he'd ever done it. And that's the point when I said, neither did I until about, well, at that time it was two or three years ago. Now it's about four or five. So I didn't either. It wasn't on my radar. It was not something that I was prepared in seminary school to be able to do. It was not something that was on my radar at all. And when it did, holy cow fire got lit underneath me and I ended up producing two into Logo. Not, not me. That needs to be clear. It wasn't me that produced them. God opened their eyes to the fact that they needed to do this and when they came to me and said this, I walked alongside of them and guided them in this. That's what happened. Wouldn't I that produced them? We're going to go into that next week. God is the one that produced them. And, and he was absolutely astounded. There's nothing wrong with going to seminary. There's nothing wrong to go with going to college. I'm I'm not saying that we, you know, my daughter is at a is, is at Ozark studying for ministry. It's not. It, I'm not saying it's a bad thing. Please don't hear me say that. Going to seminary is a good and viable option. But the problem is, is that the church should be preparing the the the, the younger generation for this. And out of that preparation, Timothy should arise. They should be coming of age and arising, and we should have a plethora of Timothys coming out of one church, let alone an entire state of churches. Our seminaries should be so backed up full that there's a waiting list to get into the seminary. But there's not. But there's not. The fact of the matter is, is that we should have people within our walls who can and can train others and send them into pulpits. And what I'm about to do is I'm going to bust the lid open on a whole bunch of pastoral secrets that pastors don't talk about to congregations. I'm going to blow the lid off of it because it needs to be talked about. Because here's what happens. Seminaries are a recent invention in the grand scheme of time. Paul didn't go to seminary. Neither did Peter or any of the other disciples. He did, God did not call fishermen because they, they'd been to school. <laughs> he called fishermen because they were moldable. Because a lot of people are, 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 are a confusion back then was that why would he choose fishermen and not scribes and Pharisees? They're studying, they're learning. There's a problem. Why isn't he choosing them? Why is he choosing the lowest of the low? They're moldable. Most of the equipping that goes on in seminaries these days is equipping the kids for megachurches. 
not smaller rural congregations. Instead, what they're taught is that smaller churches are to be used as a stepping stone to go from one church, start with a church of 30, serve them for about three to five years, use that as a stepping stone to get you a church that's about eh, 100 or so, and then you use that church as a stepping stone to get you a church of about 300. This is how we're taught. It's a stepping stone deal. This is what we are, are told that should happen. Smaller churches tend to eat pastors. It's not intentional. Don't hear me wrong. But it's caused the professors to send them into mega churches because they've got a network of people to lean on. Because what happens is when they go into smaller churches, they end up being the sole pastor, being the only qualified leader in the congregation, typically. But they have no network skills. They have no colleagues in the ministry. They have little to no leadership skills because they haven't mentored under anybody. And they have been taught not to trust the leadership of the church. You heard me right. They've been taught not to trust Anybody in the congregation, you don't grow too close because you will get burned. And that's what they tell people. It's what I was taught. My college is going to be closing in May. Lincoln Christian University will not be anymore. Is it any wonder why? Just saying. So what happens is this pastor goes in already prepared to be the outsider in the congregation. It sets the stage for conflict between him and the leadership and the congregation. He's automatically at odds with them because he's taught not to trust them. He's taught that micro congregations, dying congregations, 40 and under, stick to their ways, they're, they're stuck in their ways, and, and they drain pastors rather than breathe life into him. My first three ministries were a disaster because I went in with that mindset. I was at my first three churches, I was there for a year and a half, six months, and a year and a half. Took a sabbatical after that for two years. And oh, did God open my, mind, my eyes. See, when I went into Tologa, I went in with a different attitude and a completely different mindset. And a mindset that the congregation could actually breathe life into me as much as I breathe life into them. And that's exactly what happened. I had a rapport with the leadership. I had a rapport with the people. And I made friends there that will last a lifetime. It was beautiful. It was beautiful. And that's, that's when I put the pieces of the puzzle together that, that we're training pastors to do rather than to be. We're training, we're training these pastors to, to, to go out and run the church like a business, not like the body of Christ. We are, tell, we, are, we are taking it from a calling and making it into a career. Ministry is not a career. It is a lifestyle. I don't do this to make money. I don't do this for power. I don't do this for influence. I do this because I have been saved by Jesus Christ. Amen. And I have a passion to see people's lives changed because of that. That is why I do this. And when it comes right down to it, I would do it for free if I had to. Because that's how much Christ has influenced me. That's, that is how much he's changed my life. 
And because pastors go in with this mindset, they, they, they teach their congregations to treat the church like a business too. That's the problem. I asked two weeks ago if you've been discipled. Has somebody taken you along and been your Paul? <clears throat> Walked along with you through your life, through the scriptures, through everything, and just mentored you. And then I asked, if you have, then what have you been discipled to? Being discipled to do relies completely and solely on self-reliance. Being self-made. It relies on my ability to change and do good. We teach people to be involved rather than reforming a worldview. We tell people that they either need to be in sales or in service. Are you equipped to be in sales? Evangelism. Or are you equipped to be in service and just serve behind the lines? That's what we're equipping people for. Rather than the flip side of that in just teaching people to be. Talked about this in the Matthew 28 sermon where we are, are just, we need to learn to just be a disciple. We need to just be. We need to exist. We need to rely on the power of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We need to rely on Christ for our strength, for our dis a direction for our wisdom, for our guidance, for our strength, for our worldview. We need to rely on Him for absolutely, positively everything in our life. We need to learn to just be in Him. That's what we need to learn, but that's not what we're being taught. And I'm not saying that, that, that there's nobody out there teaching this because I'm telling you, this week was absolutely, it, man, I'm telling you, it was good. I needed this week. I needed to hear that the church has finally gotten on board and they're finally catching the wind that we need to walk with people through life. COVID taught us this because, because we were all about getting butts in the pews prior to COVID. And then when that disappeared and ain't nobody could go to church, that kind of changed things a little bit. And then we realized that our committed people grew even more committed. Our people who kind of rode the fence line were kind of growing a little bit. And the people who were marginal just fell away. That's what we learned. And we learned that we hadn't been, been investing in people at all. And that is what the church talked about this week. Is that we need to be involved in people's lives. This is not a numbers game. This is not about getting people in the pews. This is not about the dollars that we're raising. This is about investing in people's lives. This is about worldview. This is about faith. This is about relationships. And then what happens is that there is no need to teach people to be in sales or service because it's going to be a part of naturally just a part of who they are. They're, good. They're going to talk about it at work. They're going to talk about it when they come through the grocery line to the cashier. They're going to talk about it anywhere and everywhere. And whether they say a word or not, it is going to bleed out of their personality. You've been with Jesus. Amen. I'm with this. What is so different about you? Man, you are just happy and joyful all the time. So it's like even when crud hits the fan, you're just, you're super nice. Like, like, what's up with that? It's what I experienced on sabbatical. For the first time in a long time, I was just an average Joe. I wasn't a preacher. wasn't a church leader. I was just a dude who worked at the meat market. Not good meat market. Yeah, yeah, it was good stuff. Homemade brats. Mm. Homemade beef jerky. Beef sticks. Yeah. I, I was in charge of brats and 
or not broccoli, <laughs> but beef sticks and, and jerky. That was my my specialty. I made all that stuff. But I was just the average guy. But I noticed that people would, treat, would, would still treat me different. They kind of silenced the cursing around me. They were careful about what music played on the radio. Because they knew that I'd been with Jesus and I, I've been like, guys, you don't have to hold your tongue on me. I've said worse than what you're saying. I, I get it. I've worked in restaurants for years. Um, I've heard worse. I, I, I've seen worse. I get it. But thank you for not. For, for, not try, for trying not to, to offend me was the whole reason, but it's not about an offense, but you know, they were trying to protect me. It was nice. So the first thing we need to do with someone who is a new convert is we need to be patient. We need to be patient. Because there is going to be this initial fire in them because Jesus has saved them and they want to tell everybody. Let them talk. Let them share their story because I guarantee you need to hear it. That's why we did what we did last weekend. That's why we did that. And it will happen every so often. Because we need to hear stories. We need to be able to hear what God has done with somebody else so that we can rejoice and praise with them. We, we need to walk with people one-on-one. We can teach a class, yes, but still, it is still going to be having one-on-one conversations with people and, 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 and just going in and reaching them where they are at. Yes, even if it means going into some pretty dark places because the dark places need a light too. And to change the pattern in order to change the American church, we cannot, af- we cannot afford to look and say, we need to change the American church. No. No, that's too big of a task. It's too big of a task. We need to start in our families first. We need to start in our local congregation next. We need to breathe life into the people who are a part of our fold. We need to walk with them. We need to help them. We need to disciple them. We need to, we need to do life together. We need to dig into scripture with them. That needs to filter down into our young folks. Because I'm telling you, our young folks are filled with some really good questions. Really good questions. When this filters into our young folks, it will filter into the seminary system. It will filter throughout our culture. You see, one of the things that was so great about this week, Jody, I'm going to use your phone. (laughs) One of the great things Jody found this week was she inadvertently left, on accident, left her phone at home. And, And... in honor of that, I put my phone down a lot more this week myself because I looked at my report this week. My phone usage was way down, like 25, 30%. And it was refreshing. <laughs> we need to stop letting culture influence our emotions. We need to stop letting culture dictate our relationship with our Savior. 
We need to start being the examples in our culture for the light to say, y'all need Jesus. Y'all need a savior. He loves you more than you can possibly imagine. He is not out here to hate you. He's not out here to condemn you. He's not out here to send you to hell if you just come to him in sackcloth and ashes, <clears throat> humbly coming to his throne <clears throat> and asking him to save you. I know that you've been scarred by a church. I know that somebody who calls himself a Christian has not portrayed Christ accurately to you. I understand this stuff. But judge Jesus not on his followers, but judge Jesus on his character. Judge Jesus on himself. How do you get a church to turn back to Jesus? One congregation, one church, one family, one person at a time. It literally starts with one. One of the things that I am so encouraged about is that this church is ahead of the curve. We do not understand how blessed we are. Because I've had, I've been a part of eight different, I had a church, you know, kind of count this up. I've been a part of eight different churches since I came back to Christ. You know how many of those had a healthy leadership? Two of them. That's 25%. An actual functioning biblical leadership. Two of them. We do not know how blessed we are here. This is one of the churches, by the way, if you hadn't figured that out. This is one, this is one, this is one of them. Yeah, yeah, this is one of them. We've got a great leadership team we have got a great congregation, people who are here full of asking questions. There's not a week that goes by, there's probably not a day that goes by that I don't get a question from somebody. Somebody's always asking a question, and they're good. Like, stuff that, that I've researched, and boy, am I glad I've done the work and put the research in, because I'd be lost if I hadn't, because y'all are asking some great questions. It's, it's filtering here. People are beginning to catch fire. I can teach you doctrine. I can teach you theology. I can teach you the Bible. I can teach you a whole bunch of stuff. But I cannot teach you passion. I cannot teach you desire. I cannot teach you these things. This is something that is caught, not taught. Passion is caught. And one person catches fire, it's going to catch fire in somebody else. And it's going to catch fire uh, of, of them. When you throw a log into a fire on top of coals, that log will eventually catch fire. That's all it takes. That's all it takes. Your boots on the ground, here it is. Here it is. This is, I, I know this is, that we every week but this is where the rubber meets the road we need to, it's the empty chair prayer this is where we 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 start putting our our boots to the ground because because we pray for an empty seat if they are missing for, if there's somebody that next, that's next to you that's missing pray for that person reach out to that person hey are you fine we miss you we need you Oh, they need us too, but we need them as much as they need us. We, we need each other. This is a symbiotic kind of relationship thing here. 
We depend on each other. We need you to be a part of this thing. We miss you when you're not here. Pray for that person. Reach out to them. If there's a seat next to you that is not filled with anybody, pray for who you can put in that seat. Pray for who God can put there, not you. Pray for who God can put in that seat. Pray for what you can do to be a part of filling that seat. Ask God to... (laughs) Ask God to allow you to be a part. Present something to you. Present an opportunity to me, Lord. Pray for that. That is an answer that you have ever prayed that you will answer. Provide an opportunity for me to witness to someone to somebody to bring into the fold to have a conversation with somebody. Did that a couple weeks ago and it happened. And it happened again the next week. God will answer that prayer. 